This is a reading from Evidence of Satan in the Modern World by Leon Cristiani. <clears throat> further evidence. But there is further evidence to be drawn from Monin's biography. In 1842, 13 years after the Abbé Bibot's visit, there arrived at Ars a penitent who was still vacillating in his intention to confess to the saint of Ars. This penitent was an old soldier turned gendarme from the department of Ain. As was usual, he had risen in the middle of the night to wait at the door of the church for the arrival of the famous and deeply venerated confessor. Since he was a long time coming, the gendarme began to walk around the church, which was quite close to the presbytery. He had recently experienced some deep personal troubles and was suffering from a confused ad aftermath of sadness, anxiety, and religious terrors. At the bottom of his heart, the Christian message both attracted and alarmed him. He wanted to go, he wanted to make a confession, but was still in great conflict about his intended conversion. It was during this inner conflict, so familiar to many, whether at ours or elsewhere, that he suddenly heard a strange noise which appeared to come from the window of the presbytery. He listened, writes Abbe Monin, a loud, shrill, strident voice like the voice of a damned soul repeating again and again the same words which he heard quite distinctly. Vieni, vieni, come here, come here. This terrible sound froze his blood. He went away, deeply agitated. At that moment, one o'clock struck from the great clock in the church steeple. Soon, Monsieur le Curé appeared, at light, a light in his hand. He found the man, still very upset, reassured him, and accompanied him to the church. Before questioning him, or hearing anything of his life story, he astonished the man by, rem by remarking, My friend, you have had great trouble. You have just lost your wife in childbirth. But have confidence, the good Lord will help you. But first, you must put your conscience in order. Then it will be easier for you to put your affairs in order. I did not even try to resist, said the gendarme. I fell on my knees like a child and began my confession. I was so troubled that I could hardly put two sentences together. But the good curé helped me. He had soon penetrated to the bottom of my heart. He spoke of things he could not have known about, and which astonished me beyond words. I would never have believed it possible to read anyone's heart in such a way. In this connection, we should perhaps point out that one of the typical indications of demonic possession is, as we shall show, the knowledge of hidden facts. In later chapters, there will be several instances of satanic awareness of what is passing in a human mind. This is hardly, this, it is hardly necessary to add, does not imply that the saint of Ars had acquired his gift of reading souls from the devil. Whatever capacity Satan may have had in this direction, he was it, he has it in virtue of his angelic nature, although fallen from, from this estate. In the case of Abbe Vianney, his ability to see into the inmost heart of man was a gift of grace, which he used for the better conversion of sinners. The gendarme's statement is only one example amongst many others we could quote. The doctor's evidence. We are now able to exclude the rather summary interpretation of these demonic manifestations as being due to the excessive fasting practiced by the Abbe Vianney, or to his tendency to seek for a supernatural explanation of everything that occurred. His colleagues had at first adopted this explanation, but had been compelled to abandon it. All had finally paid tribute to his robust health and healthy calm. The tranquil realism of his accounts of these events, he was, in fact, quite willing to talk, and even sometimes to make jokes about them. Catherine Lassagne made many notes of his remarks to other people. One of his retorts to the devil was even, I shall tell them what you are doing, so they can laugh at you. But there is no harm in listening to what his physician said on the subject. Every doctor who had to deal with him agreed on this point, that from both the physical and moral point of view, he was perfectly well balanced. When his usual doctor, M. J. B. Saunier, was being interrogated on the subject of these infestations, someone ventured to pronounce the word hallucination. The doctor replied categorically, We have only one thing to say about the so-called physiological explanation of such phenomena, 
for although such explanations may be acceptable when dealing with facts accompanied by pathological symptoms, such as apathy, convulsions, signs of mania, such as are usually present and which reveal their true nature, it is impossible to accept them when the phenomena are combined, as in the case of Monsieur Vianney, with regular functioning of the physical organism, a serenity of thought, a delicacy of perception, a sureness of judgment and opinion, perfect self-possession, and above all, astonishing good health, which practically never failed, in spite of all the arduous tasks imposed on him by his profession. The doctor was right. The supernatural gifts with which God had endowed the curé d'Ars were grafted on to the natural qualities which were a matter of common knowledge. He was more gifted than any other priest of the diocese, or perhaps of his time, in the function of exorcism. His bishop, Monsignor de Ville, who had once silenced the curé's critics by saying, I don't know whether the curé d'Ars is educated, but I do know that he is enlightened, was so persuaded of this gift that he gave him unconditional permission to use his powers as exorcist whenever occasion required. We shall see him at work in a later chapter. But before passing on to this subject, we should study the way the devil endeavored to undermine this modern saint. The Greatest Temptation In his great panegyric of St. Jean-Marie Vianney, which Monsignor Fourie, Bishop of Belly, pronounced in Notre Dame in Paris, on the 12th of April, 1959, the year of his centenary, the demonic infestations were described as follows. I will not dwell on the strange affliction which covered a period of 35 years and which would have paralyzed the ministry of any other priest. As soon as he discovered its demonic origin, he was reassured. The master whom he served was stronger than the adversary. He was even able to rejoice when these nocturnal phenomena became most terrifying. To him, it was a sign that on the following day, great sinners, the big fish, as he used to say, would at, would, at his confessional become the prisoners of grace. The bishop went on to comment on what was, to him, the most important feature of the demonic persecution of this great saint. I must draw your attention, said the bishop, to the subtlest of the evil one's maneuvers, when he tried to overwhelm him with despair, and then, under the cloak of the most saintly motives, to get him to withdraw from the task allotted to him by the church. The very passion for the salvation of souls which filled the heart of the curé d'Ars was to be, paradoxically, the chief weapon the enemy would employ in an attempt to blind him as to his true purpose. He was to involve this man of God in the most heart-rending inner conflict known to man. In trying to save souls, did he not, ignorant and incapable as he believed himself to be, risk drawing them down to damnation with himself? Perhaps his true duty lay in giving place to a priest of higher caliber and in hiding his immense misery in retreat, penitence, and prayer. But he was torn in pieces by the dilemma. The head of his diocese ordered him to remain at his post and to continue to carry out his duties, which he felt to be beyond his strength, and to fulfill the functions which he felt he was betraying. Such an inner conflict is moving indeed. The devil had laid hold on him by, one, by what one might call his weak point, if it had not in reality been his strong point. He was the faithful priest, loving and wishing to serve, but he knew the abyss within and humbled himself before Christ. The devil, however, continued to lay hold of his humility in order to carry it to excess and was on the verge of converting a very great virtue into a peril for the soul. So adroit a maneuver could not fail to endanger the person against whom it was employed. The saintly curé was strengthened in his purpose to withdraw by the belief, common to many great, great priests of his time and before him, that it would be fitting to spend a little time between the exercise of the ministry and death in endeavoring to repair, by penitence, any inadequacy of action in the course of his life. The evil one, continued Monsignor Fouri, tried to lure the curé d'Ars into the sole pitfall by which he might be caught. He drove him along a path other than that laid down by God, by working on the agonizing spiritual conflict in which he found himself. Let us hear what Brother Athanasius had to say. The servant of God endured much inner suffering. In particular, he was tormented by a longing for solitude. 
He often spoke of it. It was, as it were, a temptation which obsessed him by day, and more particularly by night. When I cannot sleep, my mind goes off on its travels. I am at La Trappe, or La Chartreuse. I am looking for a quiet corner where I can weep over my miserable life and do penance for my sins. He would often say that he could not understand why he did not fall into despair at the thought of his spiritual poverty. He was greatly afraid of the judgment of God and trembled whenever he spoke of it. He would weep and say that his greatest fear was falling into despair at the moment of death. He was overwhelmed by his pastoral duty, which he carried out in fear and trembling. He did not want to die a curé. It was this fear, he admitted, which led to the second temptation to take flight. I wanted, he said, to pin God down, to make him realize that if I die a curé, it is in spite of myself and because he wishes it. Perhaps, on the contrary, God wished him to be an example to a later generation, when vocations would be less frequent to show that a priest can and should die in harness. In this day, there was not such an acute shortage of priests, which explains the following dialogue. I shall leave. The bishop won't like it. The bishop doesn't need me. He has enough priests. I must have a little time to weep over my past life and prepare by penitence for death. This conversation, on the same lines as one he had with Brother Athanasius, was with Catherine Lassagne, who concluded her report with the words, This was why he tried to go away. Yet, if we are to trust the Abbe Monet, who was conversant with every detail of his life, the saint him knew himself that his longing for retreat was intemperate, and that the devil was taking advantage of it to tempt him. We know the wild cry, Vieni! Vieni! What are you doing here? Get out! Get out! Which had been ringing in his ears ever since he began his ministry, or at least from the from 1829 onwards. <clears throat> According to the testimony of the Abbe Bibo, so we might well say that it was the dominant temptation of his life, that he resisted it courageously, although twice almost giving way, <clears throat> and that finally he obeyed the will of God and the order of his bishop, dying at his post as Christ wished. His flights, added Monsignor Fury, were in no sense acts of rebellion. On leaving, he wrote to the head of his diocese, You know that I will return when you wish it, but this method of attracting Episcopal attention to his spiritual dilemma seemed to him the best way of achieving the final liberation he so much desired. He believed that by running away he was obeying the will of God, remarked Catherine Lassagne. It was only after the failure of the 1853 attempt that he recognized the trickery of the evil one in his obsessional desire for solitude and penitence far from Ars. <clears throat> Such was the nature of the fiercest battle that Curie d'Ars had to wage with the Grappen. If the devil sometimes played grotesque, even childish tricks on him, he could also throw, show himself a master of singularly adroit and almost overpowering temptations. The Curie d'Ars and Spiritualism Our study of the Curie d'Ars and the devil would not be complete without some reference to his very clear-cut views on spiritualism, which he always regarded as an invention of Satan. Count Jules de Maubou, proprietor of estates not far from Villefranche in the Beaujolais, liked to visit the saint, who was both his confessor and his friend. Whenever he visited the district, it so happened that he had been at a fashionable party where the guests had been amusing themselves by table-turning and such like, and the count had taken part in the game, simply in order not to give offence. Two days later, when he went to Ars, and seeing the Abbe Vianney, went up to him as usual, smiling and holding out his hand. He was dumbfounded when the good curé stopped him with a single gesture, before he had spoken a word, and reproached him, sadly and sternly. Jules, the day before yesterday you had, you had truck with the devil. Come to confession. Now it would have been impossible. Now it would have been impossible for the Abbe Vianney to know, by ordinary means, what had taken place on the evening in question. Astonished but docile, the young Count fell on his knees in the confessional and promised that he would never again take part in a game which the man of God declared to be of diabolic inspiration. Shortly afterwards, when he had returned to Paris, he found himself once more in a house where a session of table-turning was about to take place. He was invited to take part, but he refused. 
Although his hosts pressed him to join in, he remained firm, so the others started without him. Hands were linked in a chain around a little table. The Count de Maubu remained at a distance, and from him, from, from his corner registered an inward protest against the game which had now started. Contrary to all expectations, the table did not move. The medium, that is to say the ringleader, was astonished, and finally remarked, I can't make it out. There must be a stronger force present, which is paralyzing us. There is also another very similar story. A young officer, Monsieur Charles de Montrison, having heard of the marvelous happenings at Ars, desired, out of motives of pure curiosity, to pay it a visit with some friends. On their way, the officers agreed that each of them would ask, should ask the curé d'Ars one question. Monsieur de Montrison alone declared that having nothing to say to him, he would say nothing. They reached Ars, and one of the party, wishing to have a joke at his friend's expense, turned to the curé and said, Monsieur le curé, here is... Monsieur de Montluzon, a promising young officer who would like to ask you something. The captain, caught in a trap, decided to enter into the spirit of the game and, not knowing what to say, asked a simple question. Look here, Monsieur, de, Monsieur le Curé, all these stories about the devil and you, which everyone is talking about, they're not really true, are they? Isn't it just imagination? The Curé gave the officer one penetrating look and replied briefly and categorically, my friend, you should know something about it. Without doing what you did, you would never have been able to get rid of it. An enigmatic yet confident reply. The officers looked at one another in silence. To the astonishment of his friends, the young captain did not reply. But when they were alone again, his companions insisted on an explanation. Either the curé had answered at random in vague terms, or he had something definite in mind. If so, what was it? De Montluzon replied that when he was studying in Paris, he had joined a small circle of supposedly philanthropic nature, which turned out to be a spiritualist circle. One day, he said, when I got back to my room, I got the impression that I was not alone. Rather disturbed by the strange feeling, I looked around everywhere, but found nothing. The next day, it was the same, and then it seemed as if an invisible hand was taking me by the throat. I was a believer. I obtained some, some holy water from St. Germain L'Auxerrois, my parish church, and with it I sprinkled every nook and cranny of my room. From that moment the sense of a supernatural presence disappeared, and I have never set foot again amongst the spiritualists. I have no doubt that it was to this rather remote incident that the Curé d'Ars was alluding. These facts should be classified under the heading of spiritualism, to which we shall refer later. But when one thinks of the divine inspiration by which the curé d'Ars was guided throughout his life and of the experience he gained through countless confessions, one cannot fail to be impressed by his unshakable conviction that the majority of the activities of spiritualism proper are of demonic inspiration. The curé d'Ars saw things we do not see and knew things we do not know. His views on such subjects are by no means negligible, which is our reason for dwelling on them without thereby purporting to resolve problems as complex as those raised by psychic phenomena as such. Assessment and Comparison To conclude this chapter, which has dealt with such special and to our modern minds such very strange occurrences, it would be right to make some final assessment and establish some comparisons. The assessment can best be made by the devil himself, who provides a satisfactory explanation for the furious obstinacy of his attacks. The comparison we can make, with the aid of the Abbé Monin, will help us to locate the saint in the tradition of the great servants of God of former ages. If the devil was so preoccupied with Jean-Marie Vianney that he employed every means at his disposal to divert him from his task, either by exhausting his energy by insomnia or by bringing him into such anguish of mind that he wanted to escape into the wilderness, it is because he knew the efficacy of the saints' prayers, of his scourgings, of his ministry to sinners. A woman who showed many signs of possession and who seemed to be almost a mouthpiece of Satan reproached him one day in front of witnesses. How you make me suffer! If there were three more like you on earth, my kingdom would be destroyed. You have stolen more than 80,000 souls from me. At the time, 
these words were spoken, the curé d'Ars had in his parish a missionary whom he had asked to preach to his flock. Turning to him, the curé, remar uh, the curé remarked, reducing by three quarters the figure which all had heard mentioned, Did you hear that, my friend? The devil claims that between us we are destroying his empire and that we have stolen 20,000 souls from him. The devil had, of course, said quite clearly, quite clearly 80,000, without mentioning the missionary. The modification was only another example of the saint's humility. The number mentioned by the possessed woman was by no means the final figure, as the curé d'Ars himself said one day, pointing to, him, to his confessional, God alone knows all the good that is done there. Although his penitents were by no means all converted, it is undeniable that for many of them, perhaps for the majority, it meant a return to the faith, or at any rate, to the practice of their religion. To come now to a comparative assessment, when one studies Vianney's spirituality more closely, it becomes clear that his immense desire for penitence was inspired by the example of the great saints of former days, and more particularly of the saints of the Thebaid and Egyptian desert. We know for a fact that the curé had studied the lives of the hermits and the Kenobites or Cenobites of Egypt, and that he was fond of quoting episodes from their lives in his famous catechisms and his sermons. He had been taught by his tutor, the Abbe Bali, to respect these saints, and he had one further trait in common with them, in that he too suffered from demonic infestations. We cannot, for instance, think of St. Anthony the Great, the father of all hermits, without recalling the demonic infestations from which he suffered. The visitors who sought him out on the barren hillsides of Colsom seldom went away without having heard a confused and terrifying medley of sounds, like the noise of horses and weapons breaking the silence of those bleak spaces. It sounded, they said, like a city besieged by hostile armies. All this uproar was caused by invisible spirits, as troublesome as the Grappen was to be many centuries later. Another famous solitary, St. Hilarion, could not begin his prayers without hearing all around him the barking of dogs, the bellowing of bulls, the hissing of serpents, and other noises no less strange and terrifying. The devils made such an uproar around the cell of St. Pecomius, the first Kenobite, that it sounded as if they were bent on its total destruction. And around the cabin of St. Abraham there would be devils, axe in hand, as if about to demolish it. At other times they would set fire to his matting, as they did to the curé d'Alsa's bed. As the Abbé Monet has pointed out, we can read through the lives of the saints, and almost everywhere we find them in open and sometimes memorable and violent conflict with Satan. We need only mention St. Benedict, St. Francis of Assisi, St. John of God, St. Vincent Ferrer, St. Peter of Alcantara, and amongst the women saints, Marguerite of Cortona, Angela of Foligno, Rita of Cascia, Rose of Lima, amongst so many others. It is not surprising, therefore, that we find many instances of Satan's presence at Lourdes in connection with the humble Bernadette, as we shall see in the following chapter.